The Four Noble Truths are the essence of the Buddha's teaching. If you understand them, you will be able to compact, contract, pack in all of the other teachings. All the other teachings of the Buddha are simply as supports for the Four Noble Truths. And of course, there are many interesting psychological insights. There are aids to living in the ordinary life as well, advice to the householder, comments on uh, the nature of the universe, even animal behavior, all kinds of what we would consider to be somewhat scientific types of uh, discussions, but they all are at the service of understanding the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths are the ultimate teachings of the Buddha. This is said to be the contents of the first sermon. This is the one after the enlightenment of the Buddha, the first formal discourse that he gave to his former comrades who were practicing a very ascetic and extreme form of uh, spiritual life at that time, which was very common and the Buddha himself indulged in that. This is one of the things that he gave up, the extreme practice of asceticism for its own sake, as if pain was a benefit in itself. And he had also previously renounced the household life of indulgence and sense pleasures as trivial and not leading to any deep understanding of the human situation, the existential situation, really. So this is the purpose of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, often referred to as the Middle Path. And it is between these two extremes of looking for happiness in ordinary sensuous indulgence in the household life uh, that most people will think of as the source of happiness and try to extract happiness out of. And also a strong warning to avoid unnecessary, painful self-inflictions because they do not lead to the desired freedom. So it's the middle path and the Four Noble Truths express this because they contain, in fact, in the fourth truth, they contain the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths are inseparable. They're nested inside of each other. The Four Noble Truths contain the Eightfold Path the Eightfold Path contains the Four Noble Truths in various ways. So we first have to look at this Four Noble Truths. And it's amazing. I appreciate the intelligence of the Buddha in formulating this so succinctly and in a form that's easy to remember and to understand. Although when uh, this little formula is presented in the West, quite often people don't understand it. Because the first noble truth is, there is suffering. And the first reaction is, well, I'm not suffering. What do you mean? Maybe some people suffer, but I'm not suffering. And maybe I won't suffer, etc. This is a shallow understanding of what is meant by there is suffering. The Buddha talks about the inevitability, at least of death, the probability of sickness and aging. Now. Aging is not necessarily to be confused with old age. There is a process of aging where all humans, all animals, etc., are under stress. The stress of continuous change. You get used to being one age and then you find yourself at another age. You find yourself in a different decade or a different year. When you're very young, to be four rather than three is a remarkable change. It's so interesting to watch children, how their basic psychology changes between, say, the age of four and the age of seven. That's only three years apart. But they're drastically different beings at seven versus four. As we get older, then the change is a little less dramatic. Being 30 or 33 is not all that necessarily profound, but being 40 versus being 30 is different. 50 versus being 40 is very different. So these are um, 
something that all people experience. If you're, quote, fortunate enough, you will live to old age. But inevitably, old age is actually a form of sickness. The body is weaker. All kinds of structures in the functioning of the mind, etc., are under stress, pressure. So if we're fortunate enough to live to old age, then we face this inevitability of decline and certainty of death. The only way to escape from that is to die early, and most people don't think that's all that fortunate. Now, one thing we have to talk about here is a Buddhist understanding of death itself. Death is not the end of suffering. So I want to just articulate the Four Noble Truths first. There is suffering is the first truth. Dukkha is, it's intrinsic to existence. It's not always explicit in your life, but it's implicit. It means that at some point, in some way, the very fact of being alive will result in some form of uh, pain of the body or of the mind. There is a cause of suffering. The cause is sometimes given as craving, but the root of the craving, the attachment, is actually given as ignorance. And so that I would say that the deepest root, the real ultimate cause, is ignorance or lack of knowledge. We suffer because of lack of knowledge. The third noble truth is there is an end to suffering. There is an end to this distress. And the fourth noble truth is there is a path. So it's not an arbitrary thing. There is a systematic process by which you can come to the end of suffering. It's important to understand this. In the West, we're likely to get a little bit mixed up because we, we're in the Judeo-Christian culture. And even if you're a hardcore rejectionist of Judeo-Christian culture and its various beliefs, uh, you may be influenced by the ideas. You may not be aware of it. Anyway, one of the basics of this Four Noble Truths is that the path to the cessation of suffering is not arbitrary. It doesn't happen to some people. It's not like a talent or an accident. And it is certainly not dispensed from an unknown source like a deity, etc. So the Buddha is very adamant that your undoing of the problem of suffering is going to be your personal endeavor. It's not a mass thing. It doesn't happen to a whole bunch of people at once. It is not delivered from a deity or some other external source. It is not an accident of genetics. There is no way out of this through uh, scientific means. And death is not the cessation of suffering. This is very important. If you're in a materialist, scientistic society, when you look at the description of the Four Noble Truths, you may think, well, you know, it is possible to live if we scientifically manage to clear up things like cancer and heart disease. It's possible to live to be 100 years old and in good health and then die. And then your troubles are over. There is no problem with suffering. If you have this attitude, you do not understand the Buddha's intention in the Four Noble Truths. You are not actually practicing Buddhism. Now, there are many people who do practice meditation. They practice some of the psychological strategies of Buddhism. And they even think of themselves as Buddhists. But they think that the idea of continuation of consciousness after death is a kind of a, an optional belief system of the time of the Buddha and uh, hasn't much to do with the essential teachings of the Buddha. This is deeply, deeply wrong. 
It is possible, of course, to get benefits from practicing meditation and following the ethical path of Buddhism, and there is no requirement for you to believe anything arbitrarily or to accept things that you can't accept. There is no declaration of faith. However, if you do not understand that the Four Noble Truths are absolutely inextricable from the idea of continued existence, not only in this life, but before this life and after this life. And this is why dukkha, this problem of suffering, is so inextricable, because it is part of existence. Any imagined existence. It is not part of, of course, nihilism or annihilationism. It is common belief these days that one lives and then dies and there's nothing left to suffer. This was discussed at the time of the Buddha. And this is why it's also called the middle path. It's called the middle path because it avoids the extremes of the infliction of pain on oneself, thinking this will exalt me in spiritual ways, or the indulgence in the sensual life as a kind of a, some sort of answer to happiness. So that's one of the reasons why it's called the middle path, but it's also called the middle path between two extremes. One is the conviction of annihilation, the idea that when you die, that's it, it's finished. That was commonly understood at the time of the Buddha. That was a philosophy understood at the time of the Buddha. This is kind of rather recent in the West. Probably only in the last century have there been sort of wholehearted materialist annihilationists around. Atheism, materialism, annihilationism is often used as a kind of a synonym. Uh, by the way, just as a little side note, as Buddhists, we don't identify atheists as annihilationists. Atheism is a discussion to do with the existence of a supreme being, a god, you know, an ultimate creator of the universe, etc., which Buddhism has no conviction of. They have no interest or conviction around such a matter. The idea of a supreme deity is absent in Buddhism. That does not mean that Buddhists are annihilationists. So they have a very strong view of the problem of continued existence. Now here's the, here's the issue. One of the great critiques of religion itself is that it's a kind of a wishful thinking, a hope to overcome death. At the core of religious thinking, there's a fear of death as annihilation, and people invent some sort of compensatory delusion that there'll be continuation. This is possibly a valid criticism in the West of basically Christianity and uh, some of the other theistic religions. It is not a valid idea in Buddhism because Buddhism is not enthusiastic. It does not fear death. The problem with death is that it's not a complete cessation of suffering. It's just a radical transformation. And that's a problem. You can't risk the possibility that you will continue to exist after death. So this is, the, this is radically different in the Buddhist thinking. The Buddhist thinking is radically different. The problem for Buddhism is existence. It's not death. It's not annihilation. There are no problems with annihilation. There are no problems with extinction at death. That's not a problem. The problem is existing. The problem is continuing to exist. And you can't bet, because who claims to know that at death you are annihilated? How would you know such a thing? If it's an annihilation, you can't personally have insight into that. You can't have a revelation and see on the other side that there is nothing. There's nothing to see. And there's no special claim of intuition. It's only if there is something, continuation after this life, 
that one could possibly claim to have insight into that, to have a special view of that, to have special knowledge about that. So for Buddhists, it is not a fear of death that motivates this. It is absolutely undercuts a lot of the discussions and arguments that you would have in the West about religion and the philosophy of religion, all of these things is that for Buddhism, the problem is existence is inevitably tied up with suffering. And the only cure for this is outside of the condition called existence. That is the cessation of suffering outside the condition of existence. Let's go over the Four Noble Truths again. The first one is, there is suffering because of existence. And it's the stress and demands of continuous, endless change and the fact that the change is out of control. This is opposed, I was talking about the middle path, this is opposed to the idea, especially in Christianity, of an eternal heaven after death. Buddhism rejects that idea. Buddhism is in line, I suppose, with modern science, with this idea of entropy, that everything is subject to decay and eventual disorganization. Nothing lasts forever. There is no conceivable existence that lasts forever. That would violate all of the basic laws of the universe. So, Buddhism has an idea of heaven, and in fact a very nicely articulated idea of heavens, very many, of all kinds, delightful places. They do not last forever. They have limits, they have conditions, etc. And that presents a problem, even with the idea of heaven. So. Heaven uh, is a kind of a version of human life, but without problems and very long-lived, but it's not a solution. So this is why it avoids the extreme of eternalism. And it rejects the extreme of annihilationism. So it does not hold the idea that you are annihilated at death, and it does not hold the idea that if you're good or member of a certain faith, that you will be reborn in heaven and rejoice forever. Those are rejected. Those two possibilities are rejected. Instead, is a kind of a realistic assessment that all situations, good situations and bad situations, are temporary and they come to an end. They dissolve and that is fundamentally a problem with existence itself. So the second noble truth is the cause for suffering. And the cause for suffering ultimately is ignorance, which results in a kind of, quite often referred to as craving, but really craving is a form of attachment, in a sense, both to desire, craving we usually think of as, as wanting something, but rejecting things is also a form of craving. Your rejection of things, which is usually formulated as anger or disappointment or irritation. This is a form of attachment, actually, deeply connected to the situation, and you want it to be otherwise. You reject it. You demand that it become otherwise. And then you also have on the other side the positive, the desire. These are two things that flip back and forth, negative to positive, positive to negative. You want something and you don't want something. And this is the manifestation of ignorance. You remain in a trap between these two things. But at the root of it is a lack of understanding. The deeper our understanding of this dilemma that all beings are in, all conscious living beings are in a dilemma, the dilemma is caused by existence itself. So it's not something you can get out of by having a fancier existence. These days, uh, 
the idea that you're going to download yourself into a computer and avoid a lot of, of death and all this kind of stuff. Any conceivable existence will have intrinsically in it a problem, including downloading yourself into a computer. <laughs> you better make sure that the uh, whatever runs that computer is immune from the laws of entropy. It will degrade. It will have a problem. So ignorance is ignorance of the fact that there is no way out of the problem of suffering within the cycle of existence. That's the big picture in the Four Noble Truths. The third Noble Truth is there is an end to suffering. And a synonym for that would be Nirvana or Nibbana. I'm from the Theravada tradition the early suttas and the word which is commonly pronounced nirvana in Sanskrit is pronounced nibbana. So we use that as identifying marker that we're speaking from the Theravada position. Now this nibbana is the extinction of suffering. And as I said, it can only occur ultimately outside of the realms of samsara, any possible condition of existence. However, I would say that this is realized within existence, the realization of the cessation of emotional suffering is realized within a being's existence. So one could realize it as a human and many people in history have claimed to have realized this and the Buddha himself of course claimed to have realized Nibbana or Nirvana in this very life. It happens in this life. It's not something that happens after death. So you want to really distinguish this from the idea of heaven. So in the Christian idea of heaven, it happens after you die. You might get glimpses of it or something, but it's a condition that occurs after a human dies. Nibbana is something that occurs while a person is alive. It occurs in human consciousness, a realization of something that the distress, which is promoted through ignorance, has been overcome by wisdom. And then the question remains, then what? When that person dies, what? And the Buddha is clear that there is no continued existence after that in any form which is subject to distress. When people try to discuss, well, is there another sort of realm which has no existence? They always fall into the idea of some sort of continued existence uh, in a heavenly kind of condition, etc. So whatever one might conceive of as a kind of an eternal ongoing condition of ease is not what the Buddha is pointing to. All that we're left with is that the unsatisfactory conditions which cause suffering can be undone and extinguished in this very life. What happens at the end of that is not discussed or speculated on by the Buddha. There are discussions which point to the fact that that very question is problematic and show that the questioner themselves have not understood the situation. The fourth noble truth is the Eightfold Path. And I just want to point out that this is an interesting order for these four noble truths. There is suffering, there is a cause of suffering, there's an end to suffering, and then there's a path that leads to the end of suffering. Now, you wonder why it's not formulated as there is suffering, there's a cause of suffering, there's a path that leads to the end of suffering, and there's an end to suffering. Why not in that order? And you can articulate it in that order. The Buddha just puts it in an order which is said to be something like modeled on a doctor's a visit to the doctor. The doctor first determines that there is a problem. Secondly, 
they look for the causes of that problem. What's the cause of this rash? What's the cause of this cough? What's the cause of these headaches? And then it's, if there is a cure, it's possible to treat this thing, but only if there is a cure. But if it's a disease where there is no known cause and no known cure, uh, then all we can know is there is a problem. But if we can say that there is a cause to this, but we don't know the cure. So some cancers, we understand them as having a cause, but we don't know the cure. We don't know that they can be cured. So that's why the doctor's kind of uh, formula is the Four Noble Truths. There is a problem. There's a cause of the problem. We know what the cause is and it can be cured. And then after that, they give you the prescription. This is what you have to do in order to cure that. You take that home and work on it. And uh, that will lead to the cessation of this illness. So that's why it's formulated like that, just for that sake. This talk on the Four Noble Truths is particularly to cut through a lot of what's taught in modern Western Buddhism. In the modern West, Buddhism is taught as a kind of a, a therapy. It's to help you along with your attention deficit or your, your struggles with, with your relationships or your problem at work. It's to increase some sense of well-being. And that's it, because we realize that in the West, there is a vast predisposition to either be from Judeo-Christian culture with all of its beliefs, or from a scientism culture with all of its beliefs and convictions. And so in an attempt to not cause discomfort or argumentation, Buddhism is presented in a very therapeutic way, a psychotherapeutic way, not discussing and not investigating what the Buddha really says about what happens at death and the importance of your view about what happens at death. So this is primary to Buddhism. There are movements in Buddhism. There is uh, agnostic Buddhism, atheistic Buddhism, secular Buddhism, etc. They flatly are in denial of the historical sutta orientation. Now, I'm not in a debate with them about what science says about what happens when you die, etc. Or a debate about rebirth, etc. That's not what they are speaking of. But I would say that anybody who denies that the suttas describe this infinite condition of existence, the cycle of birth and death is what the suttas are concerned with. An attempt to dismiss this or replace it with a kind of a modernized version of it, which is acceptable or palatable to the Western mind, is something that is quite obvious that people would want to do. However, it's very disingenuous. Anybody who reads these suttas will see that thousand times it's very clear the attitude expressed in those suttas is endless birth and death. And there's no way around it except by being some form of denialist, which is a very, very unfortunate mental condition to be in denial about these things. It's black and white in the suttas. I'm not making a claim for its truth value, but I'm making a claim that anybody who denies that it's in the suttas, in the original teachings of the Buddha, has a very strong agenda, extraordinarily bending the truth. Now, these days, these suttas are available in English, and anybody can read them for themselves. So you don't always have to be relying on some teacher to tell you what's in those mysterious books in a foreign language. You can read it for yourself. Anybody with a reasonable level of intelligence can read these things for themselves and see what's in them. And you will see a very distinctive spin put on it. 
by those who are inclined to materialistic, annihilationist types of descriptions of things. I'm not attempting to persuade you one way or the other about these things, but I'm attempting to say that you won't find that, that annihilationist view in the suttas. You will find it very clearly and strongly discounted. And you won't find eternalism in there too. So Christians come to Buddhism and want to reconcile it with Christianity. And they somehow see an eternal heaven in Buddhism. That is also a complete spin and distortion. These are the two extremes the Buddha rejected. Eternalism and annihilationism. Indulgence in sensuous things as happiness and painful practices as an exalted way to spiritual freedom. Those are what are described as the middle path between those extremes. Annihilationism, eternalism. Sensuous happiness and painful practices as leading to well-being. Those are what is meant by the middle path. This is not subtle. I'm not analyzing a poem or anything like this. This is so often repeated hundreds and even thousands of times throughout the massive collection of the Buddha's teaching from the Theravada, the Pali Canon. So this is a, just a basic presentation. I hope to give you the monastic, mainstream monastic point of view as I'm trying to bring this to the West. I'm trying to bring this to a Western audience that has been fed a lot of pablum. And a lot of the basic teachings have been spun and diluted and ways around it have been found. But I think it's time that people grew up in the West and faced the facts of what is truly expressed in these teachings. So this is an introduction and I will continue with the Eightfold Path over the next uh, series.